Welcome to Raising OKC Kids, Conversations with Metro Family in Oklahoma City. I'm Erin Page, and today I am thrilled to be joined by licensed mental health therapist, Katrina Leggins, to discuss ways to lower our parent stress and overwhelm. This is such a needed topic. Thank you so much for joining us, Katrina. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here today. So before we dive in, I want to start by telling our listeners a bit more about you. Katrina is a licensed mental health therapist and owner of her private practice, Elevate Mental Wellness, LLC. She's also a self-care educator, writer, and public speaker. She's an Oklahoma native and the owner and founder of K. Nicole Writing, LLC an informational and inspirational platform that helps motivate individuals through mental health education, empowerment, and inspiration. Many of our listeners will recognize Katrina's name as she's been a blogger and writer for Metro Family with her newest article on coping strategies for stressed parents appearing in our May-June 2022 issue. Katrina, this level of parent stress and overwhelm seems to be at an all-time high. I know for me as a mom, I assumed once we got through the peak of the pandemic that I would be feeling back to normal, but that has not been the case, and I suspect that's a similar situation for moms and dads everywhere. So why is it that some parents may still be feeling abnormal levels of stress and overwhelm right now? So that's a good question. And you would think by now, okay, I should be used to just how the world is right now. But the fact of the matter is uncertainty still very much exists. And I think that alone is really hard to navigate and very stressful to deal with because there's so many things that continue to happen that's outside of our control. And we have to figure out how to navigate through that. The economy, inflation is real right now. So this means that everything has gone up. So we're having to pay more for groceries, pay more for gas. That's that's more money that we have to put towards our households that we didn't have to before. And that can be really frustrating and also really stressful because you're having to rebudget and figure out how to make this work for you and your family. Even job security. You know, some people have jobs, but at the same time, it may be hard to navigate in that work environment if you have once worked from home, but now you're working in the office. So having to figure out how to work through that where it's it's comfortable for you, especially if you were used to working from home for two plus years, because some jobs are requiring their employees to come back, um, but that doesn't mean employees are ready to come back. And that's hard, especially when you are with your families, you know, every almost every single day the past two years. Um, parents who have children in school, I think that's another factor because with the virtual learning that caused a lot of stress in itself. And unfortunately for a lot of children and teenagers, uh, learning was, was different. You know, there, that was a huge adjustment in itself. So I believe that here we are now, there's some challenges academically that parents are having to deal with as a result of what their children were going through during that virtual learning phase that was required and forced. Um, so having to figure out a way to how to balance that and, you know, be there for their children who are having those challenges. And then most importantly, COVID still exists. You know, we, I don't know if you have heard about it, Erin, but I'm hearing another peak is coming soon. And so having to prepare for when it's coming and what to expect, I think can be a little stressful because here we are again, having to navigate through this, uh, but no, don't know when it's going to happen, how, how long it's going to happen as well. And that can be scary. Um, so the fear of, you know, this still exists and it being really hard to manage for many parents um, while trying to juggle so many different things, I believe is causing levels, higher levels of stress and making parents still feel very overwhelmed right now. I just need to stop and thank you for that affirmation <laughs> of what so many of us are feeling. Um, I mean, it's one thing to feel this, but it's another to have an, an expert put into words why we are feeling like this. So I'm, I'm just, I feel like I'm, my whole body is nodding <laughs> in agreement with everything you just said. So thank you for setting that foundation. I think it's really important for us to realize that this is not normal. And, mm -hmm. and that level of uncertainty, like you said, is stressful. And it's, it's okay for us to feel like that. 
But now let's talk about what we do about that. So before we can even address our stress or anxiety as parents, you advise that it's really important that we each individually identify what that looks like for us, what our triggers are, what we're feeling physically in our bodies. So what are some practical ways that parents can start to do this? Mm -hmm. So first and foremost, I'm always going to recommend to educate yourself on what stress and anxiety symptoms look like, because there is some parallels, but then there's, you know, significant differences when it comes to stress and anxiety. And so just having a basic understanding of what those symptoms look like is, is definitely important. Um, once you have a basic understanding of what stress and anxiety looks like, take note and be mindful of the physical and emotional symptoms you're experiencing and the duration. Time frame is everything because some things are going to be situational where, you know, obviously I might be stressed if I have a work deadline to meet or my kids may have an event coming up that I have to make sure I don't miss. And so the stress of like making sure I am available and don't miss it is, is where the, that's the, that's the stress factor. But once it's over, the stress is done. Like I'm not as stressed or overwhelmed, but if those feelings linger and I'm having a hard time managing it. Okay, now the stress seems like it's turned into anxiety for some odd reason. And so understanding again what the major differences are with anxiety and stress is important and knowing the timeline and the duration is very, very important. Um, take time to reflect. In the article I recently wrote for you all, I provided a few self-reflection questions that you can ask yourself as a way to check in with yourself. I, it's so interesting that a lot of people don't make enough time to just literally have a few minutes with themselves to check in, in on their feelings, their needs, um, what they might need less of, more of, their support, you know, if they need resources. There's so many things that you can miss when you don't take time to reflect and figure out what it is you need physically, mentally, spiritually, emotionally. Um, this can be a very practical way to help discover what it may, what it may, sorry, what you may need, whether it's more or less of, I might need, um, less time. Um, I hate to say like, just like I'm with friends every single weekend, but I'm not at home enough. So I might need to figure out a way to spend less time where I'm spending more time at home, where I don't feel like I'm taken away from my home environment, but just figuring out a way to balance that where I'm still having that, you know, social aspect that I'm not neglecting, but also having that, um, time at home with my my kids and my family um, so I can you know have that balance so educating yourself knowing the symptoms knowing the duration taking time to self-reflect so you can figure out what your needs are <laughs> I love that in the article you go through like you just talked through what stress is and what anxiety is and for me that has already been so helpful to be able to stop and think am I stressed or is this anxiety and then I love how you talked about what does your body feel like? And then moving on from there that we've really got to understand that piece of it for ourselves before we can jump into, you know, I, I'm a fixer. And so yeah. I want to jump right into how do I fix this? But I love your advice that we really slow down and get a better understanding first. Absolutely. One of the coping strategies you talk about um, is self-talk, that we need to check our self-talk as parents. Um, I was thinking about how, you know, we are all as parents teaching our kids every day to be kind to each other, to themselves. It sounds really simple, right? To, to think about being kind to ourselves, but it's hard. <laughs> this is actually a really hard thing to do. So first, why is considering how we speak to ourselves important? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, when we are speaking negatively about ourselves and experiencing these ongoing negative thoughts, a negative mindset can have significant lasting consequences. And so thinking of it in that aspect can kind of help put things more into perspective of doing the opposite. Negative self-talk tends to increase feelings of unhappiness, dissatisfaction, and it definitely impacts our self-esteem. Um, when you think about speaking to yourself positively, it's not about ignoring the issue or pretending like it doesn't exist. It's more about choosing to face a situation with positivity, with optimism, with resilience. Because I think when people, you know, they may struggle because they're they're thinking, well, I'm not really 
facing the issue because I'm pretending like it doesn't exist. No, you're not acknowledge it. It's real. Like whatever you're feeling is going to always be real. Uh, what you're thinking is real, but then how you choose to deal with that situation it, whether that, if that's positivity, then you're choosing to deal with that in a different way. You're not ignoring it. You're choosing to face it differently, which is a hard concept because I mean, when we're having those negative thoughts, it's really, really easy to sit in that. And it's so, it can, it can, it can be a really dangerous situation if we dwell in that and sit in that for too long. Um, and when we're practicing, you know, positive self-talk, this can become a habit where we're becoming more compassionate with ourselves but also to others. So there's so many benefits with positive self-talk, but like you said, it is hard. I'm not going to sit here and pretend like, oh yeah, just start, start speaking this today. And then tomorrow you'll feel <laughs> a complete difference. You have to practice it just like anything that you want to get better at. And so, um, but, but yeah, it, it feels a little strange sometimes at the beginning and you may not feel like you're being authentic, um, but it's a practice that you have to continue doing before you can feel like this is, this is working. So it's a practice. That means it's okay. If we're not great at it at first, that means right. that we can always, there's always room for improvement and that's okay. So what does incorporating positive self-talk look like in a busy parent's day? What small steps can we each start taking to do a better job at this in our everyday lives? Mm -hmm. So um, what it can look like as far as an example, literally saying to yourself, whether it's speaking to yourself um, in your head or out loud, I'm a good parent. I can handle this situation. It's okay if I make a mistake. This is my favorite one. I'm allowed to rest and relax without mm -hmm. feeling any guilt, you know, because I know that that parent guilt is real. I work with a lot of parents that express that that situation or that being a situation, the problem that exists. Um, steps to take uh, when it comes to identifying this area, recognize what the triggers are that are causing the negative self-talk. So negative self-talk. So for example, if you're tired, if you're hungry, if you're stressed, how do you typically talk to yourself? Nine times out of 10, depending on where you're at, as far as like how you're speaking to yourself and how you cope, it may not be the best. I, I'm going to say, number one, I have those problems myself sometimes. If you catch me on a day, I'm hungry or tired. Um, I'm probably already saying things that probably aren't the nicest, but I, I know what my trigger is and I know how to reverse that, reframe that because I know where it's coming from. So I'm going to validate how I feel, but I'm going to make sure and try my best not to create a home for those negative thoughts for those negative feelings, because I know what can happen if those stay. So definitely validate how you feel. Just don't create a home for those thoughts and those negative thoughts and negative feelings. Um, and then try starting small, creating one or two affirmations, positive self-talk that you can start saying to yourself daily. The, the examples I gave at the beginning are perfect, or you can use something along the lines of that. But what matters is that you're, again, going back to that practice word, you're practicing how to speak positively to yourself. It's, and, and it's going to be difficult, especially if you've never done it, or you feel like you have to have this whole long mantra that you have to say every single day that might feel like a chore where I don't want to do it because I don't have time or I don't feel like doing it because I don't feel it's being, I'm being real or I'm being honest with myself. So that would, I would, I would recommend trying those things to um, take those steps to be better at it. It's such great advice. And um, I am such a believer in affirmations like this um, because, I mean, I can look back and, and find times in my life that I've really struggled and then find times in my life that I felt very capable, um, even in difficult situations. And nine times out of 10, the difference is how I'm speaking to myself. Um, yeah. It, it, starts to really even create a difference, I think, in our physical bodies, um, makes a difference in our home life and the people around us. So thank you for walking us through that. I, again, sometimes it feels a little bit inauthentic when you get started. It feels a little bit weird, but um, I, I can say from firsthand knowledge that it, it makes a huge difference, I know, in my life and in my family's life. So as we are working on improving our own self-talk, I think this can be a big motivator for parents too. It really does benefit our kids. Mm -hmm. so tell us more how 
our positive self-talk for ourselves benefits our kids? And then how can we start to teach them this practice too? So yeah, of course, it definitely can benefit them and more so it benefits them. It's a, it's a skill that benefits their mental health overall. Um, positive self-talk um, using affirmations is a coping skill. Um, and so you demonstrating this, you know, you pra practicing this with your children um, can definitely help build their confidence and anxiety. Um, it can even improve their, their focus and concentration. Um, one way to, to help your children when it comes to the self-talk, um, I love recommending the repeat and complete technique uh, with using I statements. So I feel this way because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and then using the affirmation um, in addition to that, you know, I may have felt really sad today at school because I didn't get to sit with my friend at lunch. But I know that regardless of not being able to sit with that friend today, I can try again tomorrow because I'm confident and I love myself. You know, there's, there's something along the lines of that. But again, you're you're teaching your child how to how to how to say those statements where it's real, where they can take it with them at school. Um, and even when they're not in school, reframing, we talked about this before we got on, um, is a technique that's helpful, really difficult, especially if you're used to speaking in not so positive ways all the time, but reframing your thought process around a situation um, so you're not dwelling on that for too long. And, and again, bef before you know it, if you're practicing, practicing this for so long, it becomes a habit. And so now you think, okay, this is a negative thought I'm having, but what can I say that can be a, a reframing thought where it doesn't feel as bad or I'm feeling more hopeful? Um, breaking down why positive self-talk is important and how you practice it, um, it's just a great conversation piece that you can have with your children. Y'all can come up with mantras together or, you know, self-positive talk um, together. And I think that could be something you guys talk about before school or right before bed. Um, again, I'm going to use that practice word again, because before you feel like it's a habit, you have to keep doing it. And your kids see everything you do, you know, they look up to you. And so if you're doing it together, that could be a great bonding experience too. Um, knowing that, okay, my mom or my dad does this. And so I love the way they feel or how they act once I see them, you know, speaking negatively to themselves and about themselves. That's so great. I love the idea of making this a whole family practice and what a gift for our kids. You know, I'm, I'm learning this technique in my late thirties and going into my forties. And I think about if my kids could really incorporate this practice into their lives now, um, that's going to set them up for great mental health for years and years and years to come. So that makes me really excited to think that they can really start learning and, and using this now. Let's talk about self-care, which you are such an advocate of. You have so many wonderful tips, such great advice around self-care. We're almost halfway through 2022, which is hard to believe. How can we pause at this point in the year to consider what we need as a self-care tune-up? Mm -hmm. First and foremost, I did not realize we are almost halfway through the year. <laughs> oh gosh. So yeah. So the six month mark, the halfway mark, I think it's a great opportunity to take like inventory or kind of audit how you've been feeling, how you've been doing overall um, since the beginning of the year to now or to that six month mark um, and just how you've been navigating the last six months and what goals you have and haven't achieved. I think that some people can be really hard on themselves if they haven't hit personal deadlines or goals. Um, and that's okay. I mean, especially with how the world is right now. If you know that your intention is to, to get there and you're actively trying to get there, you're still on course. You just might have to change your, your timeline. And that's not the worst thing in the world. Um, so using this time frame to just really take um, that inventory on how you're doing, how you're feeling, what you need, what you don't need um, is, is really helpful. Um, when you think about um, self-care practices that you have and haven't used, I think is important as well. Um, a lot of people feel like if they've been using a certain self-care practice for X amount of years, that's that's their go-tos, which is great. But when life changes for you, when circumstances changes for you, self-care is going to start to look different. And that's okay. 
you may not have the same results using the same self-care practices you used before because of a, a major life transition that you've experienced. So you have to figure out, and again, during the six month mark, maybe a great opportunity to figure out what it is you need to not do anymore, or maybe step away from and introduce into your life. Um, it's okay if things don't work out the same way that it did before, just figure out what you need, honestly and truly, that's going to help you feel recharged, rejuvenated and restored. You know, those are the, and when you think about self-care, to me, that's part of what self, that's a big part of what self-care honestly looks like. You're what's recharging you, what's restoring you, what's rejuvenating you. Um, and build your self-care practices around those things. So um, be honest with yourself too. I want to say that because sometimes people don't want to face a reality of a goal or something they might not have achieved. And again, that kind of goes back to that positive self-talk we talked about earlier. You know, it's okay if you have not gotten to this place yet, but you know that you're actively right now working towards that. So don't, don't be so hard on yourself. Ooh, don't be so hard on yourself. That's, that's the mantra we all need to take forward. <laughs> <from here. laughs> Absolutely. Um, one of the facets of self-care you talk about that I just love is saying no and doing less. I think I'm so intrigued by this because I'm not always very good at it. So in this world, especially of comparison and hustle culture, how do we shift our mindsets to understand that reducing our commitments can actually help us be more productive and leave space for the things that are most important to us? Oh, hustle and grind culture. Oh gosh, it has distorted every, well, not everyone, a lot of people's thought process. Um, so I recommend and remind people to remind themselves that rest is productive, regardless of what societal norms are saying um, that you should do and what's and what you should not do. Rest is absolutely productive. Without intentional forms of rest, you eventually put yourself in a position where you're forced to have to rest, and that recovery time may be a lot longer. You know, so think about um, how rest is more of a proactive approach versus a reactive approach. Um, think about how you feel when you choose to slow down, take breaks and rest. That also is a thought process that may help you understand and remind yourself, okay, when I choose to slow myself down, take my time, rest and take the breaks that I need, I can do things more in an effective way because physically and emotionally, I feel better. Social media, I got to bring this up because I feel like whether it's professionally or for leisure purposes, I think that sometimes we are on it more than we need to. And sometimes a social media detox is necessary, um, especially when it comes to how often you're using it. Um, if it's interfering with family time, with your personal time, whether it's work um, or things you're just needing to take care of, social media is good. It could be good and bad based on how you use it. Um, what you expose yourself to is so important. And this can even include what you're watching on TV, what, you're, what type of music you're listening to and also who you're surrounding yourself with. People don't think about that too. Um, Cause you may have people that you surround yourself with who choose not to sleep, who choose not to rest, who choose to just be out all the time. And that is not the type of energy you wanna, you wanna be around all the time or not at all, depending on where you are in your life. Um, the hustle grind culture can cause negative effects towards your mental health and physical health. You choosing to rest at the end of the day not only helps you, but it helps others and your family. You know, I don't know about you, Erin, but when I don't rest enough, if I know I'm on the go, 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 and if you catch me in the midst of that, my, my attitude, <laughs> um, my feelings are probably not going to be the best because I haven't poured into me enough. So I don't have any more else, else to give. My bandwidth is low. Um, but also that's a time that, uh, you can reflect and figure out what it is that you're needing to do, do more or less of. So, um, yes, I hope I answered that question. <laughs> you did. And this is one, um, for all of our listeners, when you are not doing a social media detox, please follow Katrina at K Nicole writing, because you always, I, I just feel like your content will always just hit me when I need it the most to remind me to rest, to remind me to think about self-care. Um, it's just great reminders. And 
especially in the midst of all the hustle and all the comparison, it's always um, great for me to stop when I see those messages from you and think, how do, how do I want to be in the middle of this chaotic world? So I always appreciate that message. I think it's so important for us to hear, especially when we're not hearing it from a lot of places around us. We're hearing the opposite a lot of the time. Thank you. Thank you for that, saying that. <laughs> well, it is true. I, I just appreciate you so much. Every Everything that you write, I'm like, yes, take notes. <laughs> one, you're right. One so. thing you will always get is a reminder about your mental health, your or the importance of your mental health, your self-care and rest. Because it's crazy that it's not talked about enough. But again, that's that culture and grind, a cult, a hustle and culture grind uh, for you because it's it's just... Yeah, it's not a world or a side I want to be on. I was there before, though, you know, and that's part of why I talk about it, um, advocate about the importance of self-care now. So, yeah. That's so important. So important. So as we are living in this chaotic world, what are the physical or mental signs that we need to pay attention to as parents that would alert us that our stress, our anxiety, depression, that there's something going on with us that means we need to seek professional help? Yeah. Okay. So that's another good question. Um, especially as parents, because you, you know, you feel like you have to put yourself second, but in reality, ignoring any type of physical or mental health signs um, can cause more harm than good and be very detrimental to your mental and physical state. So a few mental signs, I would say, number one, frequent, uh, frequent mood swings. So how often are we experiencing anger, um, stress, we're feeling sadness, and again, going back to duration as well, how often is that happening with those frequent mood swings? Um, also, look at how you're feeling when it comes to your happiness. Do you lack happiness? Are you experiencing a loss of hope? Does anything bring you joy? And again, how long is this going on? Um, another mental health sign would be neglect you neglecting your parental duties. Like you're totally just not taking care of your children in any type of way, or you're just doing the bare minimum. Like you've changed completely when it comes to your parenting duties. Um, completely stopping taking care of yourself. Like you just, you don't put any effort into how you look. Um, bathing, showering, just taking care of your basic needs, um, because those are the, the basics that we obviously need to be able to take care of. Another um, sign to not ignore is how you cope. You know, there's lots of coping tools that we can use. Sometimes people rely more on substances as a way to cope ongoing. And again, when we're using coping skills like that, it's not a long-term effect. Um, it may help you in that moment, but it doesn't give you the effect long-term that you need. And if you find yourself using this ongoing, that's another red flag. Um, another one could be you're feeling overwhelmed with typical day-to-day -day tasks that wasn't uh, overwhelming before. But all of a sudden, um, you feel overwhelmed, which may also kind of lean into you lacking patience with yourself and kids um, and feeling like you're just not a good parent at all. So all those things they can happen or you can feel it every once in a while if it comes up. But if this is something you feel like you can't get a hold of, you can't grasp, you can't work through on your own, please do not hesitate seeking out a mental health professional um, or at least um, speaking to someone that you trust that can help link you to a resource or a mental health therapist. But so, because I know I understand sometimes it's really hard to take that leap on your own but at least talking to someone you can trust who can lead you into the right direction, getting the help that you need professionally. I say to my kids all the time when they are having difficult feelings or hard feelings, we just kind of have this statement in our house that when you keep your feelings inside, we can't help. And mm -hmm. when, you, when you talk it out, it either makes you feel better to share your feelings or then we can, as your parents, help get you the help that you need. And sometimes I have to remind myself to do the same thing for yeah. me. Um, 
That's so important. And I'm, I'm just such a huge proponent of therapy. Um, I know it has been so life-giving for me, for multiple members of my family. And um, a therapist friend of mine <laughs> recently said, if you have a pulse, you should be in therapy. <laughs> oh, I love that. <laughs> and yes. I said, good reminder. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I needed that motivation. <laughs> It's so important. It can be so helpful. And I think too, um, you mentioned this in your article that it's life-giving for our kids too, mm -hmm. to see if they see that their parents are seeking therapy or counseling and um, that shows them that it's okay for them too, that it, that's just, it's just as important as taking care of our physical health. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It helps you know, um, change that stigma around therapy, which I feel like it's better now, but it obviously still exists in having those conversations with your children at an early age and them seeing that you're in therapy, you even talking about your experience with therapy. Yeah, that opens, that opens the door of, okay, I want to try this on my own and see if this helps with the situations or feelings I've been experiencing. So yeah, I thought that was really important to highlight in the article. Loved it. Uh, I thought that was such a great point. Okay, as we wrap up our conversation today, Katrina, there's so much heaviness as we've talked about for parents and families right now. So I like to end on a hopeful note, whether it's in your home, in your work or out in the community, what is giving you hope right now? What gives me hope? Um, I think about how far I've come professionally and personally <laughs> when it comes to my goals that I've set and being able to be in this place where I didn't think I would get here um, just because of a lot of things I've experienced in my past. So that alone just gives me hope um, that I can keep going. Um, I have really amazing friends and family that are supportive. And I know that everybody can't say that they have those type of people in their lives. Um, but I have several that won't allow me to, <laughs> to, to give up um, um, and stop what I'm doing. And my clients, my clients honestly give me hope. So if you're listening as a client, yes, because you remind me that this is what I'm, I'm called to do. Um, and I'm great at what I do. You know, I have to, I have to boost my ego sometimes because there was a time and place where, um, I struggled like having the confidence in myself. So yeah, that those things give me a lot of hope to not give up, um, and to keep going. And that was like the perfect example of some positive <laughs> self-talk. I love it. That yes. was awesome. That's just that. That's what we all needed. We needed to see that example so that we can all yeah. do that in turn for ourselves. Thank yeah, you thanks. so much for joining yeah. me today, Katrina. This has been so helpful. Again, everything you write, everything you put out in the world, I always feel like is so life-giving for me. You've provided me, I feel like so much help and hope. And I know you do the same for others. So thank you for all that you are doing for your clients and for our community too. Of course. Thank you as well for having me. I enjoyed this conversation and I hope whoever listens is helpful for them. I know it will be. For our listeners, you can find Katrina's latest article on coping strategies for parents' stress, plus her blog about self-care at metrofamilymagazine.com. You can also connect with her on her website, knicolewriting.com, or on social platforms at knicolewriting. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Join us next time on Raising OKC Kids.